then I, I had friends, you know, it wasn't completely in isolation, but I certainly felt like I was, that I wasn't cool, that I wasn't, mm. you know, considered, I certainly wasn't popular. And there was just some pain connected to that because I think I felt misunderstood. I think I felt awkward socially. I think I felt self-conscious. I knew that being attractive, being pretty was a big deal for females. And that was very clear to me, but I felt like I had no ability to, at the time to kind of, I don't know, I just didn't pull any attention at that point. Welcome to Stories of Hope in Hard Times, the show that explores how people endure and even thrive in difficult times, all with God's help. I'm your host, Tamara K. Anderson. Join me on a journey to find inspiring stories of hope and wisdom learned in life's hardest moments. Today's guest is a wife, mother of three, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Illinois. She has a PhD in counseling psychology. Her teaching and coaching focuses on helping members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, both individuals and couples, achieve greater satisfaction and passion in their emotional and sexual relationships. She teaches online relationship and sexuality courses, workshops and retreats designed to foster self and sexual development and create happier relationships and individuals. She's a frequent guest on podcasts and writes articles for blogs and magazines on the subjects of sexuality, relationships, mental health, and faith. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife. Jennifer, are you ready to share your story of hope? Yeah. Wonderful. So there is an interesting little known fact about you, and that is that your parents had you pay for everything after the age of 12. Why don't you tell me about that? (laughs) It sounds almost abusive. um, (laughs) Just interesting though, right? I think it makes me think, so I got to know more about it. (laughs) Well, you know, I grew up in a family of eight children and my father was a professor. My mom was home. Um, There wasn't a lot of extra money. Mm -hmm. And... And so, you know, obviously the basics were paid for, but anything that we wanted, our parents just basically said, it's up to you to earn the money for those things. And so I really, I was a child that was born legally blind. I had plus eight. Um, I had eye surgeries when I was young too and things like that. And so I desperately wanted contact lenses because I had these Coke bottle glasses that were very mm. awkward looking and they cost, you know, I can't remember like three to $400 at the time, which was oh. for a 12 year old child, a, a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> and so, but it, it really was up to me if I was going to get them, I would have to come up with the money. And so I just in some grade went and found a book on the shelf of my library about how to make money. And and I decided one of the ideas in there really jumped out at me, which is to make Christmas decorations and to sell them. And so I started sewing and making lots of Christmas decorations and taking them door to door and selling them. And I actually, you know, sold, I think that first year I made like 150, which I saved. And then the next year I did it again. And I um, did gingerbread houses as well. And I made like 400 and something that year. And so, wow. so anyway, I was able to get the contact lenses, which was a big deal for me at the time. And <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> now, they, they were 300 to $400 every year. Did you have to no, buy a new uh, no, every year? No, I didn't at the time. It was just buying a set of lenses and then they lasted for a couple of years. That's how they did it back then. I, I can't remember. But I think even if you upgraded, it wasn't the same cost. It was like you know, you had the eye appointment and the fitting and all that, that was that initial cost. But anyway, so wow. somehow I was able to keep it going because I kept selling Christmas stuff. I kept selling gingerbread houses. Um, and then I started doing interior, exterior painting with my brothers in the summers and interior painting later on my own. as just a way of keeping income coming in. And, you know, at the time I thought it was really 
a bummer because my friends, their parents would just give them allowances and money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I often didn't have as much to draw from as they did. But you know, looking back, I mean, I'm grateful because it certainly taught me the idea that I could attend to my own suffering in a way. I could attend to hard things by working hard and make mm-hmm. things better and kind of trust my ability to be resourceful in that way. So that was a good thing. That, that is such a needed skill in life, don't you think? Yeah, it is. Oh and honestly, goodness. it's not really something I've offered to my kids. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I mean, really, I, I think, you know, they're so busy with school and music and, and, and I've kind of in, on some level wanted to spare them that kind of pain in a way. Yes. But I think sometimes I've, I overcorrected in no sense because I, I think that it's not just my kids. It's kind of more cultural now, but there's not mm-hmm. as much room for kids to kind of prove their own capacity outside. You know, there's a lot more attention of parents to children in a way. Yeah. And uh, some, it has a downside as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. Now, kind of morphing into your adolescence there, you, you mentioned that you felt pretty socially awkward. Why don't you talk me through how you were feeling at that time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was a a child who, well, okay, and then because I had to provide my own clothing, I had like two pair of pants and two shirts for the year, you know. Oh, bless you. (laughs) Right, I know. And so I I also hit adolescence very late, so I was very small. I was kind of, you know, undersized relative to my peers. I was in some ways much more mature than my, my peers and in other ways less mature because of hitting adolescence kind of late Mm -hmm. and so there was a kind of imbalance I think in some ways in my maturation like a lot of the things my friends or people around me were interested didn't appeal to me they seemed immature to me I don't don't mean to sound judgmental but it just wasn't Mm -hmm. the way I was thinking about life but another in another sense I still felt more connected to my family than to the social world because I was in some ways sort of behind and so I think it was just sort of like it was a little hard for me to find a peer group that I felt like I really identified with and I really felt at home with. And I, I had friends, you know, it wasn't completely in isolation, but I certainly felt like I was, I, and I was right about this, that I wasn't cool, that I wasn't, mm. you know, considered, you know, I certainly wasn't popular. And there was just some pain connected to that because I think I felt misunderstood. I think I felt awkward socially. I think I felt self-conscious. Um, I knew that being attractive, being pretty was a big deal for females. And that was very clear to me, but I felt like I had no ability to, at the time to kind of, I don't know, I just didn't pull any attention at that point. I was, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of scrawny and um, I, anyway, there was lots of things. My hair was too thick and I decided to get a perm, a permanent wave, which was really, <laughs> really in at the time. It was, <laughs> I think we're about the same age in the eighties, yeah. boy, those perms yeah. were fantastic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so I had so much hair already and then adding a perm to it was like not a good look, but anyway, so <laughs> it was tough at times, but it, it oh, was, yeah. you know, yeah. So I was just trying to figure out my way and figuring out what it meant to be a female and to, um, you know, I liked guys, but I was also a little bit afraid of being in a relationship with a guy because I felt like then you kind of had to be their backup and sort of step down from them. And that scared me. So I, I tended to kind of hold back socially and it was good for building a, a, a deeper inner life, but I certainly had a lot of self-consciousness at the time. Yeah. Boy, you just about described my adolescence too. <laughs> I feel mm, like we're yeah. bosom buddies all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this, because this is something that I think a lot of teenagers struggle with. And, and some people, even into their adulthood, struggle with those feelings of low self-esteem and self-doubt. Yeah. How, what do you do to teach? I know you have a, a women's retreat where you teach principles that help women mm-hmm. find worth in themselves. What are some of the things that we can teach both teenagers and adults to do mm-hmm. to find that inner confidence and self-worth? Well, it's a big question, but one of the things I would say is that 
it's developmentally appropriate on some level to self-doubt, meaning it's appropriate to be uncertain about who you are and what you're really about because you just haven't lived long enough to sort all that out. And where people get stuck though, you know, when I think back on my adolescence now, I'm like, well, that sounds pretty normal really in the sense that I shouldn't have had a ton of confidence because there wasn't yet much basis for having it in an honest way. Mm. And, and so it's developmentally appropriate, but I think where a lot of us get stuck is that we spend too much time or we get stuck in a pattern of referencing how other people feel about us and trying to keep other people happy with us as a way to feel good about ourselves. And again, while that is normal from a developmental perspective, because we all start out referencing other people to make sense of ourselves, that if we keep doing that, we really will struggle to ever have a solid sense of self. Because if you need other people to make you feel good about you, you're either going to be kind of in a one down position with people where you're constantly looking to them to tell you you're okay, or you'll go in the opposite direction, which is to kind of be in a demanding or superior position and trying to get other people to yield to you to feel okay. But it's an inherently dependent position. And while the one up person looks self-confident, right, because they're demanding or entitled or bossy, it's a weak position because it requires being, you know, controlling or demanding from other people. And so the only way that you develop true self-confidence, in my opinion, is it's kind of there's two elements to it, although I think they're very related. But one is, you know, you the most important thing is that you have to, you've got to live up to your own values, ultimately, to be free of other people's judgments. And so if you're constantly referencing what everyone else wants, but not attending to who you are, to what you desire, to what you believe, and taking those seriously enough to wrestle honestly with those questions, because I think it's not just all hidden inside you. It's something you're sort of um, sorting out and figuring out through your choices. But that, that is the anchor point is into your kind of highest self or your highest desires because when you have that you're not as vulnerable to how other people feel about you because you're at least living up to your own expectations yeah so and, so kind of figuring out who you are and gaining confidence in yourself as an individual and do you do that just by um having success when you attempt to do things and say oh look i did that and i did a good job yes Yes. And it's learning through failure too. It's, failure mm. isn't when things, it's important. It's part and parcel to the development because when you do things and it doesn't go well, it's an opportunity to learn, learn about yourself, learn about the world and make adjustments that allow you to thrive within that world. Even though it, you never have perfect control, you have at least control over who you're going to be in the face of those challenges. And the more you do right by others and by yourself, meaning to yourself, the more confidence you gain because and it's an honest confidence. It's a confidence in your ability to handle, to live life on life's terms and to kind of abide the principles that life dictates in a way. Um, but the way you gain confidence is by sort of subjecting yourself to it and learning from it and mastering it in a way. And I think a lot of us, that's a painful process often. And so we look for loopholes. We look for ways out of that process. By, <laughs> yeah, the easy way like, out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of us, and especially women that I work with around some of this, will look for ways to be in a more dependent position or looking to other people to tell us who to be because we have a little more cover. We get a little more shelter from having to think about what we desire. You know, I do this women's uh, self and sexual development course called the Art of Desire. And it's really helping people look at their desires in general 
and how many women often hide from knowing their own desires in life in part because they don't know if other people will validate them, if other people will be okay with them. They can also get a sense of self through kind of supporting somebody else's desires. But when you don't attend to your own desires and develop your own self in the world, not only do you deprive others of your gifts and your capacity, but I think you corrupt something inside of yourself because you hide it out of fear. And I think that self-development is really essential to self-confidence. Oh. That if you tuck it away, you will suffer. No, I, I love that. Um, there's a really great quote by author Richard Paul Evans, and he says, treat yourself like someone you love. Yeah. And I think that's the key that so many people who are struggling with self-worth and self-doubt are missing yeah. is, is they love other people and they show them love, but they often don't do the little things to take care of themselves. Like, oh, I need to go to the doctor or the dentist, or yeah. I need to take care of myself too. I need some quiet time for me. I need a, yeah. a break. I need, you know, and, and we as women are especially prone to that, yeah. right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. I think we're more wired in a, in a way, in some ways more attuned, can read more quickly sometimes than men can, what others would want from us. And it's, mm. it's probably part of keeping a baby alive. And, and so it's, it's functional. But when it is too, if we're too attuned, and it can often distract from attending to our own development, attending to our own needs, and desires. So let me ask you this, where does having a relationship with God fit in the realm of self-confidence and inner self-worth in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Well, I leaned on that a lot as an adolescent because I, while I felt very misunderstood by my peers, um, I really felt in my heart a sense of God that knew that God knew me and loved me mm -hmm. and believed in me in a sense. And, you know, that wasn't always clear. That was something I actually kind of pursued and sort of thought in a relationship with God. And so I was really kind of asking God if I deserved a better life and if it was okay for me to pursue a better life. And, um, and that was an honest kind of pursuit with the divine like is it do I have permission in a sense and mm. and that was very helpful for me because it really helped me to feel that it was okay for me to become stronger it was okay it was not only okay it was right for me to lean into my desires and lean into um the woman I wanted to become because I, I really was kind of offering, I want to be stronger. I want to be educated. I want to be, so I grew up in a family that didn't really value education for women in the way it did for men. You know, I, and, you know, my mom had one year of college. My dad had a PhD. Nobody was telling me not to get a college degree, but it was more about getting married. And, and so, but I wanted a lot more than that. And, um, and, so I was kind of going against what I felt was sort of culturally being offered to me, both through my faith and also my family. And so it was kind of believing that, that God was saying yes to me. And then I allowed me in a sense to be more okay with the fact that other people may not understand it or other people may think it was wrong. I know that some people at the time I was growing up in the eighties and mm -hmm. thought that, you know, that it was not good for a woman to go pursue a PhD. And I got pushback from people, not in my family, but from other people that I knew and cared about. And I was able to just not worry too much about that because I felt clear about it within myself. And so, and that had a lot to do with my relationship with the divine. Oh, that's so well put. And, and I honestly think that is really one of the keys because I too, feeling socially awkward as a teenager, that is where I kind of found my anchor was I knew I was yeah. a daughter of God. I knew that he loved me. And yeah, I didn't fit in with a lot of the people I was around, 
And I kind of mm-hmm. had to gain my own self-confidence and realize that people would accept me for who I was. But, you know, yeah. it's, it's a good place to reach and to realize God does care. He's going to guide me. And it may not be the typical path, right? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. And you have not continued on a typical path either. You, you have been blessed yeah. with uh, a bump in the road as far as a son with special needs. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, Graham, who is now 20, was, um, is our oldest child. And um, he was, seems very typical in his development over his first year of life. And then mm-hmm started to seem more atypical or like something wasn't quite right, but I wasn't sure if I was just being overly concerned as a parent. And as a lot of people thought I was like, a lot of people were saying, no, 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 you're just, you're just, you know, you're overly worried. And I wanted them to be right. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) I hear you loud and clear. (laughs) I wanted so much for them to be right. And, um, and then when Graham, turn to I just knew in my heart like something was wrong something was off and so we took him um, in to be assessed and so he was diagnosed as being um, a child on the autism spectrum Um, they called it PDD NOS at the time but um, pervasive developmental delay but he um, and so that was a challenging time for me for lots of reasons. Um, one is that I, I mean, I think to start with is that it kind of punctured a kind of core insecurity of mine, which is I'd, I'd married into a very educated, very intelligent family. Mm-hmm. They were all Ivy League educated. And I came out of a family that not only didn't really value education so much for women, but I think in some ways, my father had some insecurity about his own intellectual capacity that I think was present. It kind of infected us a little bit as kids. I mean, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to say that, but I think my dad was sort of had some kind of, I don't know, he sort of didn't believe in us in a way. I don't want to say it more nicely Mm -hmm. than that, but that was a little bit of a quality. It was never articulated or said but that I just sort of felt it while at the same time, I kind of valued this idea of being really capable. So I think I just had a fundamental insecurity about it. And so when I married into my fam, my in-law family who are lovely people and never did anything to make me feel unwelcome or less than they really didn't. I just carried this sense of being less, you know, like somehow I just mm. wasn't worth this gene pool in a sense. And so when Graham was born, it, it felt like, it felt personal to me. I felt like I was, it was sort of exposing. And I have to tell you, I feel embarrassed to say that right now. I feel embarrassed that that's where I was because it Mm -hmm. feels unfair to my son. It feels unfair to me. It feels yeah, (laughs) like I'm sort of objectifying all these people that I love, but that's where I was. And it just felt kind of like exposing of something uh, really uncertain in me. So I think that was painful. Um, I also didn't know my in-law family very well yet because I'd only been married a couple of years at that point. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and so I think that was a piece I also didn't know, like, was, was, uh, was my life going to be the same? Was he going to be okay? Was, were my husband and I going to be okay? There's so much uncertainty. Yes. And shortly after Graham was diagnosed, my husband was laid off from his job and I oh. was trying to get my, I know. <laughs> and I was, and I had gotten pregnant unexpectedly because once Graham had been diagnosed, I was like, wait, let's just hold off. I just need to know that, you know, because we may be genetically predisposed, the chances of having a second child are high and maybe we should wait. And unfortunately, I mean, fortunately, actually I was pregnant, but I, at the time I just thought, oh my goodness, I have no idea. What if we have two children with special needs? My Mm -hmm. husband doesn't have a job. And I was trying to get my dissertation finished and feeling pretty overwhelmed because I was now pregnant and trying to get it done before the second child came. So it was a, it was a hard time. And there was a lot of crying at times that were not expected. I'll say that (laughs) I'd be in a store and I'd be crying. (laughs) Add the the hormones of pregnancy to it, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. 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 
so just so much that just so much that felt un, unknown and uncertain and um, hard. So yeah. What helped you get through that especially bumpy time where you just felt like you're dragging along the bottom of the road <laughs> behind a car? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let me just think about that. I think that honestly, one thing that is a blessing, but maybe I didn't really realize it until a little bit later, is that I, I was not somebody who tended to look at hard things like that and think God had done this to me. Mm. Um, and some people offered that advice to me at the time, like there's a reason for it. You know, God thought you needed to learn something, which obviously is never a helpful thing to say to anybody. No, it's not. <laughs> Don't say that to anybody, folks. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, and, you know, other people just said, you know, God trusted you because you could do this, which is all very kind. But I knew that also wasn't really true because there was lots of kids with autism and other disabilities being born into families that couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't really tend to orient it to it that way. I tended to orient to it more like this is the hand we've been dealt. It's just a genetic thing. Probably there might be something environmental that happened, something that in affected this pregnancy, but nonetheless, it just is meaning life is deeply imperfect. And that mm -hmm. just is the case. And so I actually think that was a helpful idea for me because it allowed me to say, I just have, a loss that I have to metabolize and it's just part of being in the human experience and mm -hmm. it's painful and it's okay that it's painful. That's normal. So I, I'm grateful that I wasn't shaming myself. Like I see some of my clients do sometimes for the fact that it was painful, that I was uncertain, that I was grieving, like that was all pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. And so I feel like I was able, and I think my husband was the same, to give ourselves room to grieve in a sense and to feel uncertain um, and in a way to have some compassion for ourselves around that. And I, so I think that helped a lot. I think the other thing that helped, and so one of the questions I was, you know, eventually asking myself was not what does God want me to learn from this, but God, what can I learn from this? Ooh. What, what can I learn from having this experience as a human being what can i learn about what it means to love what can i learn about what it means to be human what can i learn about who i want to be as a person in the face of this challenge and I that's that. um, i think also a helpful framing because it's much more about not about trying to get hidden messages in reality but more about subjecting yourself to reality and letting it teach you Mm -hmm. and letting it teach you about God and goodness um, if you'll let it. Mm -hmm. So I think another thing that was extremely helpful for me during that time was people that were willing to just listen and really in some ways not give advice. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, there are a lot of well-intentioned people who were giving advice that they really didn't have any basis for because they weren't experiencing what I was experiencing. And there, but there were other people that just would compassionately sit and listen to me or cry with me and just say, it still makes me cry thinking about it, actually, <laughs> just say that they cared, you know, that they, yeah. that they felt for what I was going through. And it meant so much to me to just have the, 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 the sharing of that, b bearing that burden together in a sense, in that, at least in that moment and in that conversation and it helped tremendously. I mean, it's a really amazing how much it actually helps you deal with the diff difficulty to know that you're cared about in that. Yes. So, you know, and my mother-in-law, I remember her just, she'd just send me care packages just Aww. because I, and, and it just meant something to me like this, she's thinking about me. She mm -hmm. cares about what I'm going through. You know, it, it's, it's not necessarily that I needed a new pair of pajamas, but she was thinking about me and she mm -hmm. got me those new pajamas. And it means a lot, you know, it does. It means a great deal. And I think it's just something to always remember that in people suffering to just know someone is aware of it and thinking about them and caring about it has a huge alleviating effect. And so that was very helpful. 
Oh, and then, of I, course, just garnering resources, like finding things to help Graham and to help us as a family. That was is a very helpful thing, too. It is. And, and it helps once you have a diagnosis, because mm -hmm. then they know exactly how to specifically try this treatment and that treatment for this specific yes. diagnosis, right? So exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's wow. Right. So, yeah. So... I feel I felt so many of those emotions too. In fact, I was just thinking earlier this week, uh, a friend of mine popped into my head who we lived by for many, many years. And I just thought she was my angel through many mm. of those times. And she was that listening ear as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's good to yeah. have people like that who, who do just listen. We're going to take a quick break. But when we get back, I'll have Jennifer tell us a little bit more about how she was able to build on these lessons and become a better person, which is something we can all learn. <laughs> how many of you out there feel like your life is chaotic, crazy, and completely awful compared to the norm? What if I were to tell you that you are normal for you? I am so excited to announce that my book, Normal For Me by Tamara K. Anderson is now available for purchase on Amazon. This book took me 10 years to write and I share 20 years worth of lessons learned in my life detours, including being in a car accident and having two of my children diagnosed on the autism spectrum. In this book, I share the secrets of how I made it from despair to peace with God's help. I also include a bonus diagnosis survival guide at the very end of my Normal For Me book. The diagnosis survival guide includes 12 tips to survive and thrive in tough times. Wouldn't you like to know what those are? So what are you waiting for? Grab your copy of Normal For Me today on Amazon. And we're back. I'm talking to Jennifer Finlayson Fife, and we've been talking about everything from paying your own way through life, lessons learned when you're feeling insecure in your, when you're a teenager, to having a child with special needs and what that looks like and things you can think about. So lessons learned, you've mentioned several of them that uh, difficult times kind of help you learn and grow and develop and become stronger. Um, you've also mentioned that that hard times help you deal with suffering and imperfection in life. Um, mm -hmm. And and you mentioned that especially when you were a teenager, right? That mm, yeah, that that's right. that you you started learning then that failure can teach us. And I know that's something I'm trying to teach my kids right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah it, exactly. It's, it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. Um, talk to me a little bit about building those blocks that help you deal with failure and, mm -hmm. and turning them into, I guess, stepping stones, we would say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it helps. I mean, I think sometimes when we, how to say it, the thing that's valuable about normalizing suffering and normalizing that life is hard is that it allows you to not make it so personal when you bump up against the hard lessons of life. Um, mm. You know, a lot of us, I think, have or want an idea that if you do all the right things, you're just going to like walk down this golden path of happiness. <laughs> and, and if you're not walking down that golden path of happiness, you're doing something wrong. And I yes. do believe, I really do believe the more you live by true principles, the, the, the easier time you'll have of it. And the sooner you learn those, the better your life can be which is still not a guarantee of happiness because you don't have control over the variables that are just a part of living in an imperfect world. So I think if you kind of sort of recognize that, first of all, we're all human and we're all in this together and it's, and it's a bit tough, I mean, right? And, mm -hmm. and so if we can just take that as a given, well, then failure can feel less like catastrophic. It means I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I'm a, you know, mm. I have no value because that's 
kind of demanding a picture of oneself and of life that is not real. Yeah. And so if you see it more as, look, we're all imperfectly doing this. I mean, some people have more gifts than others, and some people have an easier time of it because they've started out ahead, right? They have maybe more intellectual ability or have a better stable family or something like that. But we're all basically living life imperfectly. And, and, um, and so if you can come to accept that reality, and I think it takes some time to come to really know that to be true. Yes. But then, it does. then you can, to- yeah. But then you can tolerate better. Like, yeah, it didn't go as well as I thought. I mean, that's not shocking. That doesn't make me sad. It just, <laughs> just means that it's just life, right? <laughs> it's just life. And there's just things I don't yet know. And so mm. I can either use it as a moment to beat myself up and just say, what a failure and disaster of a human being I am. Or I could take a more honest approach and say, what can I learn from this, right? Mm-hmm. What did I do that was not in great judgment? Or what mm-hmm. did I do that I now understand better? And how can I do things differently next time? What am I going to learn from this experience um, and take from it? And sometimes people prefer the idea that life is more random and the locus of control is outside of themselves. And so they don't really learn from the missteps they take it more and say, well, you know, that was a disaster, but, or maybe God wanted me to learn something from that. And I still have no idea what it is, but I'm not really (laughs) trying to figure out what it is. (laughs) And, and, you know, and they just kind of keep going in the same way. And then they end up stumbling a lot more. Mm -hmm. But when you can take the stumbles and say, okay, what can I learn about the contours of that hole? And why was I vulnerable to stepping into it? Well, then you get wiser as you go through life. But mm-hmm. it is the cost of getting wiser. You know, you know, there's no way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Darn it. There's no other way. I know. Exactly. I know. I know. I never liked the hard times. I never liked the, the errors. They, they're painful. It's hard, to, it's hard to have the regret. It's hard to say I did that in a way that I don't think was right. Um, and yet that's just what it requires of us to get wiser in our lives. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Sometimes I wish I could go back to the younger version of Tamara and just kind of open my brain and share some of the wisdom and experience, yeah. maybe a different perspective, look at that from a different yeah. way. But but yes. again, these are things that you only gain the experience by falling down and tripping in that into that yeah. hole or maybe falling down into that pit and clawing your way back out and saying, yeah. hey, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and in a way, forgiving life of the fact that that's the way it is. Mm. Because you can say, I wish I'd better understood this. I wish I had this perspective that I now have. But there's really no other way to do it. And and in some ways, having compassion for that fact. I, I work with a lot of people who have deep regrets. You know, they they are working with me because they have made mistakes or missteps in their lives that have been very costly to them. Mm-hmm. And it's as they're starting to wake up and see things, they feel at once liberated and clearer, but then also grief that that it took so that it cost so much to learn the lesson that, you know, that they can't go back in time and make it right with their children or something like that. And it's a hard reality. And and part of living life well is just accepting that those are the terms of living life. I mean, I'm not sure how else to say it, but that if you can forgive that about life, it's easier to forgive ourselves because there wasn't, usually or often for many of us, not another possibility because we couldn't yet see our way through it differently. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the lesson there is to see ourselves with maybe more God-like mercy. Yes, exactly. That, that, that we are students in life. We are not masters or teachers. (laughs) Right. God God has that perspective. We don't yet. <laughs> We're still exactly. just stumbling around here on earth. And so to maybe remind ourselves to be merciful because of our mistakes. Yeah, and exactly. And I think it's it's a worthy thing to strive for that view of ourselves because it is more godly. It is more it is more true. It's more honest. You know, mm. you know, I see sometimes I work with couples and the the unhappiness, it's so 
predictable in a way, because when I hear the families they came out of, these are exactly the ways they learned to relate. And then they found each other. And so then they created, per, you know, very predictably the struggle that they're in. And I don't mean to say it like it's all deterministic and people can't do anything, but, you know, in some ways they weren't in a mind that could have done a lot differently yet. Mm-hmm. And so having, it's easy for me to have compassion towards it in a way, because it's easy to see, like, how would you have known another way? Mm-hmm. How would you have known how costly that was going to be until you knew it? Mm-hmm. And so then you are able to change course and take the scarier route sometimes of stepping into new behaviors, more loving behaviors towards yourself and your spouse and others. But that's usually how we work our way into more compassion for ourselves and others and for life yeah. just by living through that. So people can change is, is another one of your messages yeah. is that it doesn't matter where you've been. You can take steps to become better and different yeah. and to learn different strategies to help you be more successful, not only in life, but in marriage and your relationships. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, people change all the time, meaning people are always changing. Sometimes people, sometimes we're not changing as fast and as dramatically as we might want, or we want, might want someone in our life to change as dramatically as, as <laughs> we would like. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, but, you know, life is always giving us the opportunity to refine, uh, mm. to refine what we do, to catch ourselves if we want to. It has a lot to do with how motivated we are to be better mm. because, you know, there's a lot that pressures us to go blind to ourselves. We like, we like to do our habits. We like to do the things that we know. And it's easy to reinforce those choices in our own mind. Mm -hmm. But if you know it's a problem and you're determined to stay awake, um, you have a ton of opportunities to choose differently. And the more you choose in a better way or, you know, hitting closer to the mark, the more you develop capacity both within your mind and your soul to be a more refined human being. Mm. But it is a process of repetition, just like anything that we learn. Now, is this something that you, because you deal with uh, mostly Christian clients, do you, do you, do you tend to point them to God when they're struggling with a specific problem to have him help them through it? Do you find that people who truly do that are able to, change more easily? I definitely, you know, depending on the religious views of the person and how they're thinking about it, I'm definitely helping people to anchor into a sense of the divine or of God or of their higher self, because that's the relationship that matters the most in the sense that being in relationship, if people relate to God as someone who's going to grant them blessings. I'm going to say this a little bit carefully because sometimes people relate to God more in a superstitious way. Like if I do A, B, and C, then I'm going to be blessed with D, E, and F. Mm. And I don't encourage that thinking at all. I don't think it's the right way to see God. I think it's developmentally what a lot of people do, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's the, the best understanding of God. I think God is a loving relational presence that's there to anchor into, into that relationship, into that loving, watchful presence, to give us the courage to do hard things, to be Mm. better, to do the morally courageous thing, to stand up for the thing that may be hard that a lot of people may not like or may disagree with, but that you know is right. And knowing that God sees you and cares about what you're doing, knowing that it's a part of creating a better world, it's very, very helpful to feel that sense of being known and understood because I think it drives our courage Mm. and it drives our sense of accountability both to ourselves and to the divine. And so it's a way of facilitating our higher, better selves. Oh, absolutely. Wow. I, I love, love, love what you've shared there because sometimes we do expect that if we do, I know I, as a, when I was younger, expected that because mm-hmm. I had done, like you said, A, B, and C, mm-hmm. I expected that my results would be D, E, and F. 
And it's funny because you look in the scriptures and there is no story in the scriptures where somebody had a perfect mm-hmm. life. It, it, it just didn't, it mm-hmm. doesn't happen. And so I don't know right. why my thinking was that way, <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. but, yeah. but you're right. Tapping into him helps us have the courage to become our better selves. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it takes a lot of hard work and gosh, that's, oof. But the good news is when people are seeking for help and they come to people like you, that they can get the kind of uh, guidance and direction that they need to to continue on their forward momentum towards progress, right? Towards becoming their better selves. Exactly. Oh, my goodness. And the more we do it, the better we feel. Yes. The more you're in line internally with your higher self the less you're concerned about if other people agree with you or see you in a certain way, because you are at peace with who you are. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's just, you know, it's just the most important thing you can ever do for your own mental health even. Yeah. Oh, amazing, amazing bits of wisdom. Now, Jennifer, do you have a favorite Bible verse that has become meaningful to you through all these years, these bumps and bruises and even in through your practice? I mean, my absolute favorite one, and I feel a little bit boring bringing it up again, but it is, <laughs> it is my favorite, and it has been since I was in early years of college, which is um, in John 8.32. The, the scripture is, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Mm, because so. I've always felt that, that the truth really matters. And so searching for what is true, that you can trust it, uh, you may have what you want to believe is true, but then there's what is true. And being in pursuit of what is in fact true is painful sometimes. I sometimes joke that, you know, they edited out the part that the truth will make you miserable first and then it will set you free. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's awesome. The truth will make you miserable first, but then it will set you free. I got to say that again because that is so perfect. <laughs> Because it often, the truth often shows you that you need to change. Exactly. And change makes exactly. us comfortable, right? <laughs> it does. It's hard. It stretches us beyond our current self-understanding, and it stretches us beyond the world that we have mastered and pushes mm-hmm. us into the terrain what we ha- that we haven't yet mastered. But if you're going to be free, you've got to master the terrain of life. I mm-hmm. mean... And so it's, it's painful, it's unwelcome messages, but they're very important and helpful messages. And as a, as a therapist and a coach, like the work I'm doing is about helping people see more clearly and see themselves more clearly because then they're more able to make good choices. Oh, well, you're doing good work. Let me say that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, Jennifer, we you have been so generous with your time and with your wisdom. There are going to be people who are listening to this interview who want to find you and connect with you. What is the best way for them to do that? Well, there's a few ways. Probably the best way, it would be just my website, which is my name. So it's finlayson com. And on my website, there is access to my podcast archive, which is Lots of interviews I've done with different people um, on issues similar to today's topic, but related to relationships, sexuality, faith. Um, so those are there. I have online courses that I teach that are were created with an, with an LDS audience in mind, but lots of people who are Christian happily take the courses because I'm referencing um, ideas about Christ and Christianity and how to live your life in a way that's high integrity and how much it's related to having good, trustworthy, open relationships with your spouse and others that matter to you and, and also how that relates to um, good, uh, meaningful sexuality. So those courses are all there to, um, to learn more about. And um, then you can also find me on Instagram, which I think my handle is just Finlayson Fife and Facebook, um, Dr. Finlayson Fife. And so there, there's lots of posts and quotes, and um, I have a Facebook Live group where people can hear me talk once a month on a, on a topic that people are asking about within the group. 
So Wow, so, wonderful. Yeah. I will put yeah. all these amazing links in the show notes so that people can find you much more easily and connect with you on all of your social handles as well. So Jennifer, any final tips before we close? You know, I think it's been sort of implied in what we've been talking about, but, you know, just related to this idea of of how life can be really challenging is that I think one of the messages of faith is this idea of learning compassion and how important compassion is to living life with less suffering. Mm. And so I think one of the things that has come out of some of my difficult periods is deeper self-compassion, like for the difficulty, for the incompetency, for the thing I don't yet know, um, and being able to extend some grace to myself uh, for not for disappointing myself even and I think the good thing in that is that it offers it's easy to offer grace to others too because you know we're all in this together and we're in it imperfectly and so when others can do things that are hurtful or you can see their immaturity I think it's easier to offer that same compassion or grace and saying you know, what we're about is not easy and what what we're trying to achieve here. And so I can offer some latitude to you as well. I think Mm -hmm. it's just one of the side benefits or maybe one of the products that emerges when you're trying to submit yourself to this process that sometimes is harrowing, but ultimately very, very valuable and and very meaningful. Mm. Wow. Very, very true. We do learn a lot about ourselves and that allows us to then have that compassion t- towards others. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Mm-hmm. Finlayson Five, thank you, thank you, thank you for, first of all, sharing your story of hope, for taking us to times when you felt discouraged and the lessons that you were able to learn from those times and build a better and stronger you. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening to today's show. I know that there are many of you out there that are going through a hard time, and I hope you found things that have been useful today as you listen to the podcast. If you would like to access the show notes from today's podcast, visit my website. It is storiesofhopepodcast.com. That is where you'll find favorite quotes from today's episode and shareable memes. And those are fun because you can share them with your friends on social media. You will also find the links mentioned throughout today's episode so you don't have to remember what those were. And also all the tips that were shared. Sometimes tips are shared so much throughout an episode you forget. What were those great things? So go to the show notes, storiesofhopepodcast.com to look up these fantastic resources. You know, if someone kept coming to mind during today's episode, perhaps that means that you should share this with them. Maybe there was a story shared or a tip that they really, really need to hear. So go ahead and share this episode with them. May God bless you, especially if you are struggling with hope to carry on and with the strength to keep going when things get tough. Remember to walk with Christ, and he will help bear that burden. Above all else, remember God loves you.